Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your help. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I'm Sébastien Treyer. I'm the Executive Director of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. IDRI is a think tank based uh, at Sciences Po, Paris, the uh, Political Science University. Uh, and what we do is to try and contribute to ambitious uh, sustainable development agreements at the international scale or uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, one of the key elements that I want to discuss with you tonight is to, to I, I, could, I could base my presentation on two paradoxes. The first one uh, is that despite uh, very conflictual geopolitical relations uh, in the international scale, uh, China uh, was able to do a very good job at COP15 on biodiversity just before Christmas. And we have not something many people say a historical agreement on biodiversity i would say uh, much better than what we had ever expected in the last two years in terms of uh, what can be done at international scale on biodiversity so how come uh, we have uh, we have we continue to have uh, positive environmental outcomes diplomatic outcomes now the whole question is how you translate diplomatic agreements into reality but at least diplomatic positive outcomes when at the same time, the US and China are fighting on trade and in Taiwan, fighting more or less, uh, when uh, the Africans, uh, the African countries uh, are opposing, uh, are not aligning themselves with what uh, they should normally, they could be expected to do in terms of uh, respecting the charter of the UN. And so they don't condemn Russia, of course, although normally, you would say that uh, they have been uh, continued continuously at the African Union insisting on that. So there are lots of signs of these geopolitical tensions that are particularly acute uh, recently. And this, despite these tensions, we have uh, the diplomatic successes on the environment. The other paradox or the other contradiction that to me was extremely uh, important um, I have a, the, very often discussions with a, a very important um, Indian scholar, Sunita Narayan. She heads the uh, Center for Science and, in, and the Environment in, in Delhi. Uh, and she's one of the key, she, she tells me she is now too important with her institution uh, that uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, sh could avoid what she says. But at the same time, she's really a pain for him because she never agrees with him. So this is the kind of think tank that I would like to be in France, but I'm not sure that I have the uh, credibility and legitimacy to be as et established that I can be completely critical of my government and still mattering for, 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 for my government. But that's what she is in terms of environment in, in India. But there is a wealth of a, a whole ecosystem of think tanks in India, but I take her as, a, as an example because I talk to her very, very often. And, and Sunita uh, made, a, she, she, the, her institute publishes a state of the environment in India every year. And her forward to the 2023 edition was, what a horrible year. We have never been in a worse state than, than ever. And I was telling her that I, I thought that we had uh, obtained much better results than I had thought. So how come we can be converging at the same time so divergent in our assessment. We, we converge on what we see would be necessary for the world. And she says the world has been, the, the, the year 2022 has been the worst ever. Uh, and I say, well, we have been able to uh, maintain a link of cooperation between North and South, between East and West. I mean, East and West, not with Russia, but with China. That was not, that I was not expecting with all, all the problems that we had. So this is not actually a contradiction. It's a difference in interpretation that I want to give you some understanding of uh, why uh, I'm still quite uh, confident in the fact that we have uh, elements of dialogue that are very important in our, in our conversations between different regions. And how come we have this kind of an exception of uh, environmental uh, diplomacy why we fight on everything, we cooperate on the environment. Is the, and, and that's basically what I want to, to discuss with you. Uh, of course, one assumption would be we discuss on the environment because it does not matter. Uh, and so we can make a lot of things on environmental diplomacy. First, the environment does not matter, so nobody's serious about it. And uh, it has no impact uh, whatsoever. 
So uh, that could be the explanation. My whole presentation is try to uh, take a step back in history and, and explain to you how I see, uh, based on uh, analysis of uh, uh, global environmental governance that I'm, I'm not the only one to make, that uh, actually the environment matters. Uh, it might be one of the explanations why Mr. Putin launched uh, a war or launched so many operations in Africa to be able to ensure that even if we decarbonize the economy, he's still his upstream of the uh, supply of, of, of the European Union's economy, for instance. So I think that's Olivia Lazar from Carnegie. And I think she's quite right. In, she, she, she has documents that show that this was a, an explicit Russian strategy, for instance. So yes, to me, strategically, the environment matters. It's not something that is collateral. Uh, but second, yes, of course, the, uh, the, the, the key question is, uh, are these agreements going to translate into reality? And that this is not what I will talk mostly about today. Uh, this is a big question mark. Um, it's now 12 years that I've been investing my time in IDRI, so trying to obtain the most important agreements at uh, international scale. So that, may, that makes me quite a cynical person, meaning that I know that these agreements are not uh, sufficient to transform reality but cynical in a positive philosophical meaning, meaning uh, because I really believe that if we don't have those elements of agreements or cooperation internationally, I'm sure that we will not have any positive environmental outcome uh, locally or nationally. So that's my, uh, that's how I see why I, I invest so much of my time uh, in, this, uh, in this position at, at IDRI. Um, so that's why that was my message. Now we discuss, I could have, I could stop here, but I want, I, before, uh, in order to better launch the conversation, I wanted to take you through different steps in history to also position some of important elements of the historicity of international uh, environmental governance, and also uh, historicity meaning also the path dependency of what we of, of the institutions that we have constructed. Before that, just a few elements maybe on on. Uh, on IDRI as a structure, because you might be wondering what is a think tank. Uh, so it depends a lot uh, the, on in which country you are positioned. The legal statuses are very different, and there is no uh, official or unique or standardized definition of what a think tank is. In France, think tank is the think tanks are quite often criticized because anybody could say they are a think tank. We have a personality who's always on TV, and she's really like a the Trumpist in France saying zero government is better than any government. And she claims to be a think tank while she's only, uh, I don't know by whom she's paid, nobody, know by, by, nobody knows by whom she's paid, but she's really completely ideological and nothing is research based. So in France saying you're from a think tank is not often very well regarded. I'm happy that Nathalie is nevertheless accepting to talk to me. That means that IDRI has standards that are acceptable. <laughs> no, but I mean, compared with the academic community, think tanks might have very bad reputations uh, in France in particular. And uh, you see also a whole stream of literature in France in particular, who uh, in critical social sciences that explain to what extent think tanks have been the instrument of neoliberalism, uh, particularly paid by philanthropies of, uh, in, in the US. So uh, yes, we, I need to tell you where I'm talking from, who's paying IDRI and, and what's, what we do. Um, and I have interesting elements about that uh, for uh, reflection. So uh, IDRI is a foundation. Uh, the legal status is uh, a knowledge of public interest. Uh, so we are kind of philanthropy, but we don't have money. to. We, we need to look for the money to operate. So we are an operating uh, foundation. Um, we are uh, 45 people, um, 25 researchers or quasi-researchers, people who publish papers that are, uh, some are peer-reviewed, others are uh, our policy briefs. Um, they are mostly uh, economists or political scientists, sometimes with a mixed background, uh, uh, agronomy and economics or uh, ecology and political science. This is something that so uh, interdi interdisciplinary uh, education curricula is something is, is, a, is a type of curricula that is extremely important, interesting for us. Um, and and we so basically our budget is paid by uh, for sixty percent uh, research grants from DG Research in Brussels or from the International Fund for Climate by the French the German uh, Environment Ministry. Uh, we also have funding from the uh, European Climate Foundation, from the Gates Foundation, 
Uh, that's for the 60% that are on project basis. And the other 40% are basically French players, French ministries, French research institutes, and French companies. So the model of IDRI is that we are not, uh, we, we are happy to obtain money from some French companies as soon as uh, it's not linked to a specific deliverable that would be a, a contract for that company, but that they contribute to uh, the diversification of our funds for our overall program of work. And it's through the diversification that we don't think that we are too dependent on one of these private companies, as well as we are not completely dependent on the French government. Um, and we, um, but at the same time, the idea is because we have a good relation with some of these companies like BNP Paribas, very criticized for their portfolio in fossil fuel, of course, with ODF, very criticized for the size of nuclear in their portfolio, that we have a good relation within the company with those who try to change the company from within. Uh, this is a, a bet, this is a challenge. I cannot completely tell you that I'm completely dependent. The moment EDF, the French electricity utility tells us, we hate what you, what you write, we will, not, we will stop funding you next year, it's going to be a problem, uh, but it's not, going to be, it's not going to be fundamentally problematic because we have other sources. So if you're interested in discussing my, our independence, it's a key subject and I, I'm happy to discuss that with you. It's not the main topic, but it could be an interesting topic for discussion. The moment we disagree with the French government is going to be more critical because a lot of the funding is from the French government. I mean, the French research ministry is not a problem. The problem is the, uh, the ministry of uh, the treasury and the Ministry of foreign affairs. Uh, for the moment, on the international scale, we agree a lot with them. Um, if uh, Marine Le Pen is elected in 2027, it will be, uh, I don't know what, I, what I'll do. It's going to be problematic. Uh, and I mean, some of the funding uh, on the international uh, uh, dimensions of the French, uh, the French strategy for climate or development might be problematic. Colleagues in uh, Rome, the Instituti Affari Internazionali, so uh, International Affairs Institute in Rome, they are only funded by companies because they want to avoid to depend on the Italian government. And when it was Salvini, uh, they were very happy to not depend on the, on, the, on the Italian government. So this is just to say that independence is, in, is critical, not just with the private, but also with the public. And so it's always a, the position of IDRI is not to be completely dependent, to have that relation that makes also our relevance because we talk to these people, but it's also it's a it's a permanent negotiation on, on being independent enough from them. I don't know for my colleague Sunita Narain in India how she's funded, but it will be also interesting to see how in different countries we have, you have different models. Last thing I wanted to say: a lot of the uh, philanthropic money that funds civil society and think tanks in Europe is North American. Uh, you have a lot of democratic uh, progressive foundations that fund uh, think tanks in Europe. Uh, as, a, as a European citizen, I find it strange. Uh, as an environmentalist, I'm happy that they are there because they really, uh, for instance, on the reform of the European policy on fisheries, if you hadn't had the Pew Research Center in Washington, we wouldn't have got rid of the, the worst parts of that, uh, of that policy. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. Philosophically, in terms of uh, political philosophy, it's uh, not satisfactory that uh, there is some kind of interference by uh, Northern American philanthropies in uh, European affairs. Um, but I, can, I, can deal, I personally can live with that. Uh, and I'm happy to make use of those elements of, uh, of funding to help uh, advance pro, uh, the progresses on, on, uh, on um, on, on, on sustainable development, in particular because, uh, in any case, there are other more conservative philanthropies that also interfere with policy, uh, with politics in Europe and in other places. And I prefer to use the money of the uh, Packards and Hewlett's of the world rather uh, to counter the effects of the uh, Kochs of the world. I don't know if you know the Koch brothers who fund a lot of the uh, ultra conservative uh, movements all over the world. So that's just, uh, uh, you, you see, I'm coming from a point of view that is extremely grounded in real politique, cynical to some extent, uh, but not doing, uh, uh, trying to always understand what are the impacts of what we do in, in such a think tank. But of course, open to uh, any questions as soon as they are not too brutally expressed. <laughs> Critically expressed is not a problem. <laughs> Just 
please be polite, and then everything is acceptable in terms of discussing this position. Um, so that's that's worth a long introduction, but so you also uh, see to whom you're speaking. I, oh yeah, I forgot to present myself. I'm the director of this institute. I'm a civil servant seconded to this uh, to this uh, institute. Uh, and I've been working mostly on uh, resources scarcity, particularly water resources scarcity, and what that uh, entails in terms of uh, the uh, agricultural development strategies, both in our countries in, in Europe, also uh, in the southern countries. I've been working particularly in uh, Tunisia during my PhD. Uh, and, and so one of my key questions is, how are we going to find space for prosperity of our societies in a world where resources are limited. So the question of the planetary boundaries is really at the heart of my, of my research. Um, and so what I want to, to, to discuss with you is what, are this, what is this relation between ecological transition and uh, geo geopolitical tensions, to some extent not saying that we have a, a formal and a, a discussion internationally on ecological transition that is not related to, ecological, or to uh, geopolitics, on the contrary, I believe they are very much connected and we need to to uh, uh, probably it's because environmental ecological transition matters so much in economic terms that it's now center stage in, in political agendas but it's also a problem because now that it's center stage it's very conflictual to discuss uh, so we don't just we we do not just discuss um, uh, environmental issues as if they were not important for ministries of finance or even for ministries of defense. Uh, this, is, this is not what happens. Um, so I have, I have organized my talk and, and you will have the slides anyway. Sorry that I haven't sent them in advance. I, I forgot to do that. Um, and you can't see my title, but this was just the outline. I, I want to go to, to uh, walk us through four stages for historical stages, but as, as always, periodization is always very, uh, always, you can always question or criticize them. Um, I wanted to, to make a focus on uh, the golden age of uh, environmental agreements in the 80s. Uh, when it, in, the, in the 80s, of, although it was the, the, the a high moment in the Cold War uh, of, of uh, geopolitical tensions between uh, the Soviet Union and the US and, 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 the, and the Western world, you had very important environmental agreements that have been made. And I want to tell you a little bit about that and try to understand why uh, it's not just when we are at peace that we are able to advance environmental issues. This story of the 80s is a story that says, uh, uh, even in terms of high geopolitical tensions, countries are okay to uh, protect the environment, to, 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 to take decisions that protect the environment. Uh, and this is the example of acid rains and of the ozone layer in the 80s. But this is, I say the golden age because it's also kind of a, uh, after that, people were always thinking, oh, but uh, if we were able to do those agreements, why don't we, why can't we deliver on climate? Why don't we deliver on, on biodiversity? Uh, and probably because it's not the same problem, it's not the same magnitude, it's not the same structure of the political problem. Um, so after that, um, I want to uh, make a, a kind of a, a stop on the uh, uh, what happened between the Rio 92 and uh, the Paris Agreement 2015, and to tell you about all the different ways and, and proposals to discuss how to try and mimic what we had been able to do in the 80s with the acid rain discussion or the ozone discussion. This is the proposals of uh, clubs or polylateralism, which is still a term that is coined by uh, Pascal Lamy, the former director of uh, WTO, who is now uh, heading the Paris Peace Forum. So the, uh, the instrument that Macron is using to try and develop uh, new, new uh, uh, cooperative initiatives at the international scale. Uh, but also some myth uh, like uh, defining a global price of carbon, uh, and in the end, uh, showing to what extent uh, a very different type of agreement was decided uh, in 2015 with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, uh, leaving much more emphasis to uh, national states. So the, uh, the, the national state is re was really back on the agenda. A, a very good colleague from Sciences Po, I mean, an eminent colleague from Sciences Po, Bertrand Badi, uh, has published a world uh, a book just before the war in Ukraine saying geopolitics are over. Uh, stop. This is not the way to look at the world. 
And I believe he's right. Nevertheless, the title and the timing was not really good for him to be heard. He was saying, we, under, we overestimate a lot the relevance and power of national governments. Uh, and so we should not look at international cooperation or international relations only through the lens of geopolitics, meaning the territorial discussion between national governments, because there are lots of things that are not uh, owned by states. You have transnational corporations, you have transnational organization of civil society. You have lots of things that the national government does not control. What I try to tell you here is that in the way we organize cooperation on the environmental field, we rely on, a lot on national public policies and on national governments. I don't know if it's good, but that's a, that's a matter of fact. Um, my third point is really to look at what's happened uh, uh, since 2015, uh, where to some extent my uh, assumption or my statement that I'd like to, uh, to explain, and, and I'm happy that you discuss it also, is that uh, because of the important agreements that are the Paris Agreement in particular, uh, people, economic players have, be, have uh, begun to believe that the future of the economy is a decarbonized future, or at least a, a big chunk of the world economy is going to be decarbonized. And that reorganizes a lot of geopolitics or the relations between what are the resources that matter, where are the powers in terms of economy, and how does that impact uh, geopolitical relations? Um, and so that's uh, something where I really, this is why I claim that environment is not just a pretext for diplomatic dialogue that does not matter while security matters somewhere else. I believe that environment is now center stage in geopolitical, uh, in geopolitical both economic and security discussions. Um, last element in, my, uh, in, my, in, the, in the presentation that I've uh, prepared um, is uh, what are the main questions of cooperation that I see uh, very important uh, in the current period? Um, and in particular, uh, this is a way to look at what happened at COP26 and COP27. COP26 uh, as an element where in Glasgow last year, I mean, last year, uh, 20, 2021, uh, there was a, a whole uh, a bunch of statements about uh, the carbon neutrality is the horizon that we are, that all the countries are looking at. Uh, and, and how is that uh, really uh, credible? What, uh, what, how is that uh, uh, entrenched or really uh, embedded uh, in economic uh, decisions? But also very present in Glasgow and even more in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27, the, the claims for solidarity and justice. And this is really what made Sunita Narayan explain that 2022 was really a bad year. Uh, I was saying that we have uh, done better than I would have expected on the capacity of the Western world, Western countries, to show signs of solidarity with Southern countries, uh, the necessary ones, not the sufficient ones. Uh, and Sunita is saying that it's bullshit, <laughs> that, it's, that she doesn't believe the promises and that it's extremely insufficient and that we are really not there in terms of solidarity and justice. I just want to, to uh, uh, I, I, I probably don't want to say who's right. I mean, she's right and I think I'm not wrong <laughs> in saying that we have we could have done worse uh, in the year 2022 in terms of not having uh, the steps made to try and find solutions for southern countries. Um, what I think is very important is to discuss the changes in geopolitics where I, I will come back to that, but I saw uh, particularly lots of Indian experts saying now we need to have China accept that they are not a developing country anymore. India positioning itself to some extent as we are now the uh, leadership, we have now have the leadership of uh, the global south, the non-aligned global south, and it's not China. So that's also a, a rivalry between uh, Chinese and Indian governments in the way that they organize their positioning. Um, and a lot of these countries that I now call non-aligned, not because it's really organized as the non-aligned movement of the 70s, but because they did, they chose explicitly to not align with the Western world uh, in their decision, their voting at the, uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, these non-aligned, like in 72 or 74, 
are claiming that we need a new economic international order. Um, but that was not followed by any meaningful impact in, in the 70s, because these countries were the, 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 the weak ones geopolitically. I, I think what we have in mind with that, what, what makes us agree with uh, Sunita is that today, neither China nor the Western countries, Europe or the US, can avoid taking into account the claims of solidarity and justice of the global South, because these countries, India, of course, is both an emerging country and a very poor country. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a country that is both at, at the interface between emerging, emerging or emerged countries and, and, uh, and poor countries. But the poor countries have power. They have a power because the, uh, West, the, uh, the, 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 the important economic powers are divided. And so they can uh, negotiate their support. So this is a kind of power. But they are also the markets uh, for, the, for the exports of the economy of the big economic powers. So they are... I think they matter more than they were mattering in the in the 70s. I, I say that this is one of the key conclusions I want to come to, saying that while looking at the environmental lens, we also are witnessing this change in the in the power relations. A, a lot of what we are seeing today mirrors mirror, I don't know how you say that, pronounce that correctly in English. It's really very similar to what we have been, what people have been experiencing in the early 70s with the southern countries non-aligned saying, we need a new international economic order. Um, I believe that the situation is very different and that this claim of justice is not just a claim supported by the moral arguments. The moral, the moral argument is very true, but we, haven't, we have never seen that the moral argument was able to change decision in a, in a world where we have no uh, global government and, and where power is actually what matters. I believe today, on top of the moral argument, these non-aligned countries also have uh, other sources of power uh, that come through, uh, that, that, that are expressed a lot in the environmental negotiations that we are witnessing at Idri. And that makes that probably, particularly Europe, if, they, if Europe doesn't want to be crunched between politically and economically between the US and China, Europe is desperately looking for uh, structural allies, particularly in Africa, and is way, too far from taking the good steps for making those structural alliances real and possible. But what we try to do with Sunita in India, us at Idri and other colleagues in Nigeria, South Africa and Senegal, is to at least ensure streams of dialogue that would make those capacity to cooperate a little bit more sensible. It's both for me important as a European. I want Europe to have better relations with Africa, much better relations with African countries and with the rest of the world, both because it's important morally, but also because it's important, I believe, for the future of Europe as such. Um, and so that's the type of thing where I, th I think we need to express our dissent, but continue on dialoguing. I quote that, those two words because this is what Sunita Narain has uh, the title of her uh, introduction to the state of the of the environment in India in 2023 was dissent and dialogue, and I think that's really what we need today to be able to dialogue and express when we are not agreeing. You had a question. So sorry, I I, I don't hear you very well. Yeah, may, maybe you're pointing at something that I've not, I've not I've expressed, but I've not completely defined for myself even. What I want to say is avoid the usual way that Europe is looking at African countries at the UN. For instance, on Ukraine, we have a resolution condemning, the, condemning Russia. It's written by the US and the European governments. And then you go and see Gabon and say, please sign. Uh, this is not alliance. This is what we call in France suppletif. Suppletif was the, uh, you know, the uh, indigenous uh, soldiers who came to uh, make war in the World War I. Uh, and so this is again the same type of uh, discussion. So what I was trying to hint at with structural alliance was probably avoid, but not avoid, but really do, do things completely differently, co-construct what we want to do in order for that to be really much more balanced and symmetrical, um, but also structural in the meaning that, um, that Europe can count not in an exclusive manner, uh, with African countries as allies, because of course, African countries also need to be allies with, with China at some point. I don't say that it's ever going to be negotiable, that it's an exclusive alliance. 
but structural in the meaning that uh, on some issues, we have a long-term vision of why we want, what we want to build together. And I think that's, that's what I wanted to say with structural alliance. But this is not a, this is not a, a concept that is defined very specifically. Uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, you, the, 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 for those who are not, uh, who, who are online, the question was what I meant by structural alliances, but I, you probably got that with my answer. <laughs> I'd, I'll be also uh, disciplining ourselves so that we think about it. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so basically, that was that was these were these are the four moments that I want to uh, to explore with you in the time remaining. Um, and I I have one slide per, for each of these uh, statements or periods. Um, so sorry, I just. <laughs> um, so this is this is the uh, the Cold War period moments that I was describing before. I, I think it's important for you. Uh, I, I know that in uh, in this uh, uh, courses you have lots of disciplines. One thing that I think is important. Uh, I'm not going to quote a lot of uh, literature, but a lot of what I'm describing is the literature in political science about global environmental governance. You have, um, if you're interested in that type of literature, there is a, it's a small community of scholars called, uh, in particular, if you look at Earth, Earth System Governance. Uh, org, this is the uh, community, uh, the project that gathers uh, most of the uh, international relations scholars working on, on environmental governance. And basically, I want to do to try and uh, uh, have some teasers that you might be interested in that literature, literature, so that we understand what's what's in it. And so, one of the key elements. Uh, one of the founding elements of that type of analysis and literature is about uh, those two examples of when uh, the international community was able, despite geopolitical tensions, to uh, come to an agreement to protect the environment. Um, so the first uh, important uh, element is about acid rains. And this is international, but not global. This discussion uh, emerged uh, at the scale of the UN Economic Commission for Europe that goes from uh, Portugal to uh, Soviet Union in general. So now at, uh, the UN uh, uh, Economic Commission for Europe includes Kyrgyzstan, for instance. And so it's really also in, in Central Asia. It's a strange remnant of uh, the structuration of the UN system uh, dating back to the Cold War. Uh, and you have very important regulations in this framework, for instance, the Aarhus Convention on uh, access to justice, participation, and uh, protecting the rights of people with respect to the environment is at the scale of this uh, UN Economic Commission. So just for you to, to understand that these bodies are might be important. <laughs> what happened in the, uh, in the 80s was that uh, there, was a, there was a very interesting scientific institution established in Vienna called IIASA, IASA, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. I thought I had put it here, but no, it's not on my slide. So IASA, IIASA, was established in Vienna as a research center where both researchers from uh, Hungary, Poland, Russia, uh, Soviet Union, and uh, the US, uh, France, Germany, and Spain were gathering and really looking at systems analysis. Systems analysis seems probably for your generation something quite obvious that we need to look at the functioning of systems. But this was really, uh, just after the, the Second World War, a very advanced field of research where we, was, we were looking at uh, cybernetics, the new computer developments, uh, and the way that we look at not just linear processes, but feedback loops between the systems. So to what extent some processes are self-reinforcing. I mean, for some, I don't know, you are probably ecologists and, and specialists of uh, natural sciences for whom systems thinking and feedback loops are just very, very easy, but it, it's also the case. So you probably have seen that also in, a, in other disciplines like in economics. So at IASA, they had been developing a, a model of atmospheric circulation uh, that was uh, able to uh, explain the fact that the, the, the reason why forests were depleting and degrading all over Europe was actually due to the transfer of uh, air pollution from industries uh, across Europe, so transboundary air pollution, and particularly across the Iron Curtain. So it was not limited to the West, 
or the East, but it was all, over, all across Europe. And so to some extent, what was very interesting in that point is that scientists were able to show that there was an environmental problem. They were able to show, to explain the cause of that problem. And based on that, you had an agreement that was done extremely easily, apparently, between countries that were opposing on the uh, nuclear missiles uh, that, were, that were at that time building up uh, uh, on, on both sides of the, of the Iron Curtain. So this is something that was extremely uh, uh, important. The, uh, the, let me see if I can write something down. I don't think I have something to write down, no problem. The uh, convention that was issued to, to, to deal with the uh, acid rains is called LRTAP, Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, LRTAP. Uh, so it's a convention at the scale of Europe, uh, the UN Economic Convention for, for Europe. Um, and and um, what there are, based on that example, there are two spin-offs that are extremely important. The first spin-off is scientific. Uh, these, co this community of uh, modelers that are able to model atmospheric circulation are the ones that were also participating to the whole development of climate science. Uh, and that has been accelerating extremely rapidly in the 80s in their capacity to model uh, what, the, what, climate and, uh, what climate is and what uh, atmospheric circulation is. That was before the 80s, uh, something that was theoretically represented, but too complicated to model and simulate with computers. Uh, and so this progress was extremely rapid. I think it also explains uh, why climatologists, who was regarded as uh, the bad science by geologists, now have, uh, be, have uh, through this process, they have become much more, uh, much better consideration between these scientific disciplines. And the geologists, to some extent, were also very jealous of the uh, climate scientists. In Paris, we had a, a very important institution that is also part of Université Paris-Cité, uh, Institut Physique du Globe de Paris, where Claude Allègre, uh, an eminent geologist who was also the Minister for uh, Public Education in France, he was a geologist and he never forgave the climate scientists that they were, they were more prominent. And he was a very eminent climatoskeptic in the 90s. I explain it, I, I don't know that person. Uh, it's very caricatural about a personality that has uh, many other facets, but I believe that this was where the geologists were not accepting that climate science had really progressed much more rapidly than geology at that time. And that what they said was extremely well grounded in science. And, and he still believed that climate science was something not very well established because we were not able to represent what happens in the atmosphere. Um, but so these, uh, the, the, it's the same community of modelers uh, who developed uh, models about atmospheric circulation over Europe, and then also uh, climate, climate models at the, at the global scale. And they, it's a, maybe not exactly the same researchers, but the same community of people who also then were involved in discussing the uh, hole in the ozone layer that was uh, appearing over the Antarctis in, uh, that was in the, in the middle of the 80s, and also identifying that what was causing that hole in the ozone layer, uh, I mean, the higher level ozone layer. Ozone is a, is a pollutant in cities. Huh? It's very bad for our lungs. Uh, but in higher scales of the atmosphere, it's a protective uh, chemical because it's, uh, it stops the uh, UV, uh, ultraviolet uh, rays coming from the sun. And so in those years, it was mostly problematic over the Antarctic. But the fear was that it was going to be uh, expanding and expanding, and then that, that the Earth would, would become uh, extremely dangerous uh, because that we would not be protected from the UVs. Uh, and they had identified that the cause of, uh, the, um, uh, of the depletion of the ozone layer were the uh, chl uh, chlorofluorocarbons that we were emitting with the sprays that we had. And uh, yeah, basically in the sprays that we had, and I believe also in... Uh, in cooling and the whole industry of uh, refrigeration. Um, and so this was again a moment when um, these scientists published a report and convinced governments from all countries industrialized in the East and in the West that we needed to substitute those CFC, chlorofluorocarbons, by another type of uh, uh, chemicals. In sprays, I think it's just inert gases. 
and in refrigeration, we substituted them with uh, hydrofluorocarbon, HFCs in term, in, instead of CFCs. Um, and so these two examples, both in the, uh, in the, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the, the, on, on the ozone layer, it's the Montreal Protocol, nine, uh, 1987, uh, and the uh, Convention on Long-Range uh, long Transboundary Air Pollution in Europe was probably 86 or something like that. So these are, uh, these are key moments. And it gave the impression that, one, first, when science is right, politics aligns. Uh, and that's very strange. <laughs> I mean, if you ask any political scientist, he said this is never happening. Um, it's not just science that will align uh, uh, power. Of course, science matters, but in, in a very much more detailed way. You can't have a kind of a general law saying if science is right, then we align. I mean, this is exactly what Greta Thunberg is very angry and right, rightfully so about, that science is right and we don't do anything. So you see that this is really not what, what happens in general. Uh, so this is the first myth that emerged from, from there. If science is right, then we will align. And the second is uh, that we could, uh, um, uh, even in, in moments of very uh, strong uh, geopolitical tensions, find easily an agreement on the environment because the environment would matter or try to some, some elements that would say, we all depend on the environment, so we will find a solution even if we disagree on many other things. Um, so what I want to insist here on, upon is this is a model, the solution that was found for uh, acid rains or for the ozone layer is uh, the model that many uh, experts of international environmental government, uh, governance had when trying to solve the uh, climate crisis and saying, why don't we solve it? Why we found solutions in that, in that case? And so, of course, uh, important, it's very important to mention, these problems are simple problems. Um, and this is very often what uh, our colleague uh, Scott Barrett at Columbia University is saying. If these are simple problems and these are the ones we are able to solve, to solve then let's reduce the, the complex problem to, into a series of simple problems. I will come back to that because I don't agree with him, but that's, <laughs> that's a, an important discussion. So these are references or examples or models of negotiation that people wanted to mimic or to, to try and, and do the same for other environmental problems. What is very specific in those areas, if you look at uh, acid rains, the problem was sulfur oxides, uh, so air, air pollutants getting out of some specific industries. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, specific, you have a, a limited number of uh, uh, emis emissions, you know you can locate them and you can try and, and deal with them, and you have a technological fix to make them, uh, to, to, to capture these air pollutants or to not emit them. And so it was kind of easy to solve technologically the problem because it was a very, uh, a series, but a very limited number of economic sectors that were at stake and uh, geographically very well uh, identified and with a technical solution. The same for uh, the ozone layer. You had the industry of sprays and the industry of cooling. And with, uh, with those two industries, you find the technological substitute and you solve the problem. So in that case, even when you have a lot of political tensions between the two blocks, east and west, you have a, a, a political problem that is, uh, some people are going to lose because they have invested in technologies that are going to be obsolete in some years. How do you compensate those and substitute for another technology? This is an easy problem to solve. Those who are going to be winning could be taxed and you have to help those who are going to be losing or you find ways to compensate the limited number of losers you know, in order to just shift, a shift a an economic sector to another uh, type of technology. So it's not just about uh, taxation or an obsession with technology, technology fix. It's just that for those problems, the technology fix was quite good, and then it's easy to implement politically. Um, last thing I want to say here, at least one of the last things, is that um, the technology fixes always have problems. Um, the idea to uh, substitute CFC by HFC in cooling was smart for the ozone layer, but HFCs are extremely uh, uh, powerful greenhouse gases. 
So we have substituted an ozone layer depleting gas by a greenhouse gas. And for the moment, uh, when they decided that uh, substitution and organized the negotiation around that in 87, we had no notion that the HFCs were going to be a problem for, for global warming. So you see, that's always the issue why we need to look at the planetary boundaries in a systemic manner, is that when you have the impression you solve one environmental issue with a technology fix, it's generally a displacement of the problem on another dimension of the planetary boundaries. Um, and actually, uh, in uh, 2019, there was the Kigali protocol that was dealing with the substitution of HFCs in cooling by inert gases or other types of gases that are not going to have a, a warming effect. We hope now that these gases don't have another type of uh, environmental impact or health impact that we have not identified for the moment. But I think in that case, with the Montreal protocol and the Kigali protocol on cooling, we have a solution that, that uh, is quite, uh, quite okay. Um, and so this, uh, this is just to say, uh, we displaced the problem, but we fixed it in, in 2019. And it's very important, uh, this Kigali protocol, I, I raise your attention about it because it's very important, particularly because now cooling is going to become extremely important given the impacts of climate change. Uh, and one of the key countries uh, concerned uh, with that technology shift is to, a lot of people are trying to, to put a, as much development money as possible in the implementation of the Kigali agreement, particularly so that in India, uh, the uh, people who are going to afford buying air conditioning are buying an air conditioning device that is with the new gases and not with the gases that have a, a warming effect. And so there is a race on being more rapid than uh, the, uh, very uh, the very understandable uh, race to acquiring um, uh, air conditioning in India, given the amount of heat waves that are coming now in the, in the country. So that's uh, I wanted particularly to focus on the 80s, but on these two environmental problems, I could not resist uh, tell you the story a little bit until the until the end. And the ozone layer is it's so it's uh, the reason why people are so happy is that the ozone layer is really much, you know much much better state. So uh, the the hole has disappeared nearly. So this is a problem that we were able to solve as humanity. So let's just be happy of, about some of the problems that we were able to solve. Um, Intergovernmental Panel on, Clim on Climate Change was established already in 88. I think, maybe I'm mistaken on that, but Reagan and Thatcher were actually instrumental in establishing it rather than resisting its establishment. So those right-wing politicians who normally you would say would oppose environmental regulation, I think they were uh, quite instrumental in establishing uh, the Inter Intergovernmental Scientific Panel on, on Climate Change. Um, and so what happened in, in 92 is, um, is very important, namely that um, it, it was happening 20 years after uh, the first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm 72, where Indira Gandhi, I'm quoting a lot of Indian personalities, I don't know if this is a uh, because today I'm inspired, or <laughs> this is always, always if it's because they are very important in that story. I can't really be exactly objective about that, but I, I'm just thinking that we we had uh, last year in Stockholm the uh, uh, the celebration of the 50 years of that uh, 72 Stockholm conference on the, on the human environment, and Indira Gandhi was saying there, "This is your problem, northern countries. We have other things to deal with about development." Um, in in 92. This was the whole moment where after the proposal of the concept of sustainable development by Brundtland, um, countries of the South and the North were accepting that we had a global problem about 
biodiversity degradation, climate change, and desertification, and that all countries were had a common responsibility, common but differentiated responsibility, CBDR, common but differentiated responsibility. This is one of the principles that is enshrined and inscribed in the the outcomes of the Rio 92 Earth Summit. Very important because it means this is environment is and sustainable development is now a universal problem. It's not just a problem of the north of northern countries because it's also a problem for southern countries because they are impacted by environmental degradation, but also because everyone contributes to environmental degradation if we don't change our patterns and our pathways of development. And so this is a key shift in relations on in international community on, on environment. And I, uh, the, Laurence Tubiana, who was the uh, architect of the Paris Agreement at COP21 in Paris, she was my director when I arrived at Ivry in 2010. And she was in Rio. Uh, she came to Rio as the head of uh, a development NGO, fighting for the rights of uh, smallholder farmers in the South. And she really had the impression that what she negotiated there was a deal with environmental NGOs saying, we actually have the same goal. Our goal is not, we, we should not find between environmentalists and developmentists. We have the same goal, which is to, sh to change the pathway of development. And uh, so it's about justice and environment. Both are compatible criticisms of the business as usual pathway in the world. Uh, that was how she felt she was uh, signing down to something in, 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 in Rio. Uh, Rio was when, uh, three conventions were uh, signed, uh, the UN, UNFCCC, UN, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that has these yearly COPs uh, and uh, COP28 next year in the United Arab Emirates, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity that has COPs, uh, Conference of the Parties, every two years, the last one was in Montreal, uh, COP15, and the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification that has also a Conference of the Parties every two years, the last one, COP15, was in Abidjan uh, in June 2022. So this is very often when, when media are, were asking me, but what is this COP15? Why do you name the COP if there is another COP, if COP is about climate? So nobody understands what COP means. COP is just a UN term to say conference of the parties, but I believe you all have that in mind. Um, and this is the conference that has the most political interest. CBD, for some reason that I'm not sure of, has gained much more political interest recently. Particularly, European governments are insisting a lot on that conference, on that convention. But the US is not a signatory of that conference, of that convention, uh, which does not mean that it not, does not matter for the US. The US is not a signatory of the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, whilst they are the most important power in terms of maritime nav navigation. So the US very often, as the superpower, was not signing any of those, uh, some of these conventions. They were still influencing them a lot. They were, they were very present in Montreal COP15. But uh, for, for, um, for an American government, sometimes it does not make sense to sign and feel obligated to do things, and they prefer to be influencing a convention. They know that what comes out of the UNCBD on biodiversity or UNCLOS on, uh, on the sea is going to impact them because the standards that are established by the rest of the community will impact them but sometimes they prefer not to be a signatory. That makes things extremely complicated because in Montreal, when Southern countries were asking for money from the North to the South, the US was not there in the room to say uh, how, much they, how much money they would put on the table. So uh, again, as a European citizen, I felt, oh, the burden is again on us uh, and the US is not there to, to really uh, be accountable. But I don't want to be pro-European and anti-American because nobody's really perfect at all in those in those standards. I'm just saying this was a problem that the major superpower was not there in the conversation as one of the one of the of the of the parties who were going to sign it. They were influencing everybody but not signing. Uh, and the one that is not functioning, that's my standard, is the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Um, this convention uh, seemed to be limited to countries that have a desert. Uh, actually, the U.S. has a desert, uh, Spain has a desert, uh, and it's actually a lot about soil degradation, which is a, an issue for actually nearly every country in the world. So it's only recently that the, uh, this convention has been able to say we're actually not just about desert, the deserts. I'm sorry, because I'm always confused between dessert and desert in English, so but you understand me probably. 
Uh, I don't know where to put the, uh, the emphasis. Um, and, they, and now it's, the, it's the, uh, the convention to protect soils as a, as a global public good, uh, because soils are so important and so long to be, to be uh, established by nature that it would be very dangerous if we degrade our soils. Uh, but one thing that makes that convention not attractive for a lot of the uh, very important uh, uh, countries in the North, the, many countries in the North uh, who had money and the power had the impression that this convention was only about giving money to sovereign countries uh, and that there was no gain for them in that, in that, uh, in that, in that game. I'm, be, I'm being very cynical, but please accept it. That's uh, the matter of uh, international relations. It's, you need to be a little bit cynical on that because that's if people, when you have the power and you have no incentive, the moral argument is not really sufficient. So this convention was seen as something where Northern countries would, would only experience claims of more money by Southern countries without really understanding if that would be really uh, improving generally something. Um, so these, this is about what happened in 92. And, and these three problems are much more complex than the two ones that I presented in the former slide. If we want to deal with climate change, uh, it's actually the whole lifestyle, the whole uh, development model that needs to be uh, redesigned uh, uh, completely. It's the moment in 92 when George W. Bush, not, not W. George Bush Sr., the president of the U.S. at that time, really stated the American lifestyle is not negotiable, saying that we can discuss things, but not the American lifestyle. Uh, and this is, you probably, again, uh, uh, contrast with today, next year's G20 presidency by uh, India is about lifestyles. Uh, one priority is about lifestyles. There might be some ideological point of view on Hinduist uh, lifestyles, uh, good for the planet, I don't know. But it's interesting that this is now put on the global agenda by an emerging country, not by a northern country. Um, and so, 92, we, re we recognize that these three important uh, problems are on the table, that we need to do something as a global community, both north and south. Everybody needs to care for, for these, uh, for these uh, environmental goods or these environmental problems. But how are we going to solve them? Um, and so, um, you had different... Uh, proposals for, I would say, the 90s on climate change. This was the moment when it was not so much the climate scientists, but the environmental economists who had the impression that they would rule the world and that they would suddenly translate their academic discipline into reality. And so a lot of them were thinking, let's just have a global price of carbon. And we have a Nobel Prize of Economics in, in France, Jean Tirole, extremely well-known, extremely uh, uh, an excellent academic, but he's still saying that that, and I think it's completely politically uh, impossible to operate because establishing a global price of carbon means that you need to allocate the first uh, carbon credits between countries. And to some extent, it's allocating billions of money between countries. And that, that negotiation problem to allocate a big chunk of money is something that is, so everybody wants to have more and it's unsolvable. So I believe this is just, impossible politically. Uh, but in the 90s, the, the theory was, if we want to be uh, efficient uh, on solving the problem and fair, we have a discipline that makes that. The very foundation of economics is to find solutions that are efficient and fair. I mean, you might believe that there are other things behind the economics, but for those of you who are economists, I think that's how initially the idea was, the, the, the whole discipline was, was defined. And so they have, for instance, proposed the, the idea that we will have the Kyoto Protocol uh, for uh, northern countries in 97, uh, where we would have a uh, um, um, uh, top-down definition of who needs to diminish by uh, their, uh, their greenhouse gas emissions by uh, how much, etc. So there was a whole uh, discussion that was very much inspired by uh, uh, environmental economists. In Europe, we had the establishment of an uh, an emissions trading scheme, you know, the carbon market within Europe. And so lots of uh, these solutions were proposed. Um, but in the end, uh, Kyoto Protocol in 97 was also the very example that um, you can't push a country that is very reluctant by deciding something at the international scale. Al Gore came to Kyoto, signed the, the Kyoto Protocol, and back home, the Congress said never. 
they never ratified the, the solution. So this is something again where uh, I don't know if you were uh, already uh, uh, aware and following these ideas, but in in 2009, uh, in Copenhagen COP15 of, of the climate convention, uh, people had the impression that if we put a lot of emphasis on the negotiation between uh, heads of state, Obama was there, Merkel, uh, it was Hu Jintao for China, so not the Xi Jinping that we have now. We put them in a room, and then because they are, they are, they are very powerful, but also they have a beautiful soul, they would make an agreement and then if they have the agreement then it would it would completely change uh, their politics in their countries and that never happens uh, al gore thought that he could push the american uh, opinion uh, and the american uh, political context by by saying we need to do as the world is doing but he pushed too much and he was resisted in in his uh, national context and the same in copenhagen actually nobody was really sufficiently uh, 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 convinced that the reputation of one country with respect to the other countries would be sufficient to push uh, a decision that was not acceptable, neither in Beijing nor in Delhi, about being uh, uh, sh taking the share uh, of, uh, the, of reducing the emissions of India and China. So I'm not, I'm not blaming China and India for the, the failure of Copenhagen 29, I'm 2009. I'm just saying that it was extremely uh, vividly perceived by the Chinese and Indian delegates that uh, it was impossible for them. They were seeing that the emissions of China and India were contributing a lot to climate change, but it was impossible for them in the state of uh, the price of renewables, their state of uh, poverty, et cetera, to accept that they would be committing to reducing these emissions because it was see, uh, seen as a trade-off with their development pathway in 2009. So they were not it would not have made sense for an Indian prime minister or a Chinese president to say, okay, I signed on to it because they knew that it was not possible to, uh, to implement in their country. This very basic notion that in international relations, you can't have a decision between heads of state if you don't have sufficient uh, backing in domestic political setting is called the, 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 the two-level game, the two-level game by Putnam. Uh, it's very basic, but it's kind of very often uh, forgotten when we look at those uh, diplomats that are in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a conference center to decide on the fate of the world. Generally, you forget that they have to come back home and be sure that what they decide is actually back in their, in their own country. And this two-level game is not always just a blocking factor. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the, uh, at the way uh, environmental activists are play French environmental activists are playing the European scale and the French scale to obtain progresses on the environment in France. Sometimes it's good that you have these two level games, huh? but uh, it's just to say, I mean, yeah, yeah, I see that some people are not completely saying that it's sufficient, but I think if we wouldn't have had uh, these two level game, the state of the environment in France would be even worse than it is today. But so, so that's, that's just a, a very basic concept that is often, often forgotten. So uh, because we can't have a global price of carbon, one of the key elements that was, uh, people were looking for new solutions. And as I was telling you, uh, particularly people like Scott Barrett were saying, the global climate problem is so much about solving, changing everything in our lives that this is completely politically not negotiable, impossible as a negotiation object politically. Let's try and find something that would be slicing the problem in slices and each slice would be a sectoral problem that would be solvable and he calls that the the, the club approach trying to uh, address the problems sector by sector and finding a, a club of uh, of uh, countries and sectors that would be uh, 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 solu putting a solution on something um, and that's quite a lot what uh, pascal lamy is also proposing today with his notion of polylateralism saying 192 countries for changing everything in our lives, this is not something, it, we will never succeed in a, in a negotiation process like that. And Scott is a game theory specialist in economics, and he's making experimental economic, um, experimental negotiations with his students, uh, computer simulations, and he says, that type of problem, 
never going to be solvable. It will there is no, no space for negotiation, for an agreement in such negotiations when it's too many countries and a problem too complicated like climate change. And my director, Laurence Tubiana, in the, in the years 2000 was arguing that we might solve the problem if we look at a, uh, at a solution that would be processual based on the process of repetition and getting back together to find solutions where if we can't find the solution now, let's be sure that in five years we reconvene and see if we can't be more optimistic or more. So, so, so there was this notion that if you look at the problem today, there is no space for an agreement because the, the material interests are too diverging. But we, the idea of the Paris Agreement was to build something that would be more processual. I will, I will try to defend it, although I know that it's more and more complicated to defend the Paris Agreement as something that, that functions. Again, my colleague Sunita Narain was saying, let's drop that. This has never functioned. We need to find something else. I believe we don't have another option, but that's my, um, that's my conversation with Sunita. Um, so what's happened with the Paris Agreement? And I insist, it's the Paris Agreement and it's the SDGs. Uh, don't forget the Sustainable Development Goals. What happened in the, um, in, um, in, uh, in the preparation of 2015 was that we have had the 20th anniversary in 2012 of Rio, uh, Rio plus 20, where Colombia and Guatemala said, why not uh, look for something that would be our common project for the world, both on development and on the environment, that is going to be aged by 2030 with its 17 sustainable development goals. Interestingly, it's a proposal not by your northern countries, but by uh, middle income countries from the south, from Latin America. And I think that also made it much more palatable and interesting for southern countries because it was not Europe again trying to claim that they had the good idea for, for negotiation. Uh, because Europe came to Rio plus 20 saying, we have the solution, it's through the green economy. And uh, Achim Steiner, who was at, at UNEP, a German guy was also claiming that this was the solution. And there was a blocking from all Southern countries saying, this is again, Europe trying to impose on us uh, non-trade tariff barriers. Uh, so no, no, thanks, no, no, no thanks. Uh, and that's when Colombia said, and Guatemala proposed, why not look at something that would be looking at, at our issues completely differently. And the story behind Age of 2030 is also, I mean, the theory behind Age of 2030 is that Every country uh, signed up to this uh, political project for, for, for its country, for the world, but for its country. I say political project because there is the uh, goal on uh, gender equality. There is the goal on reducing inequalities. Reducing inequalities was not, uh, I mean, in, in the US in the 80s, inequalities were never seen as a problem. It was seen as the engine of economic growth. If you have very unequal salaries, that was good for Reagan the Reagan administration, let's increase the inequalities because this is the way that people want to do more, more to, to, to earn more money, et cetera. The, the, so the story and the ideology has changed and now every country in the world has signed up to reducing inequalities as DG number 10. Uh, on gender, and gender inequality, every country has signed up to it also. And we know that it's not uh, a given in, in many countries, but just to say that this is, I, I, I try to defend the fact that the SDGs are a political project. Uh, and what is behind this political project is to say, we all, uh, I think it was Korozi, the uh, Hungarian guy who was uh, co-chairing the process. He said, when we look at those goals that we've set ourselves to 2030, we are all developing countries. Nobody is there. Nobody is able to say that they would be able to attain these, 20, these 17 goals together. So we all need to transform our development pathway to get there. Um, and so, and every country will do it in its own circumstances with a very specific pathway. Uh, and we will need to, we, we, we will, uh, so we will try to uh, uh, be, to build a, a mutual learning to make that happen. And there was also in Addis Ababa in June uh, 2015, uh, the, dis the negotiation on financing sustainable development. So uh, a whole discussion on how our northern country is going to pay uh, cont a contribution to help southern countries uh, deal, uh, reach those 17 SDGs. For the French in the room, uh, in France, we only heard about 
COP, COP21, because that was the major thing for the French government, because we were hosting COP21. But for many countries in the South, that was much more important in 2015. Um, and if we wouldn't have had the SDGs, I'm quite sure that uh, it would have been impossible to negotiate the Paris Agreement. Uh, what happened in the Paris Agreement, this was told to uh, one of my colleagues by an African delegate. He was saying, um, we have this bottom-up discussion about every country needs to transform to reach the SDGs. And so why not? Uh, we can accept to have the same vision of the climate negotiation, where every country needs to do their best to decarbonize and to adapt to climate change. And so it's okay to have the idea that uh, everybody needs to decarbonize. Before that, in 20, until uh, in Copenhagen, uh, only the, the, the industrialized country were obliged to decarbonize. What southern countries were saying, we need to develop first and our main issue is adaptation. So African countries, emerging countries accepted in uh, Paris 20, 2015, that uh, even uh, Malawi, even Burkina Faso or Bolivia had to reduce their uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Not to the same extent, common but differentiated responsibility, but everybody needs to, needs to work on decarbonizing the economy. Um, and one of the negotiators from Africa told one of my colleagues, um, we explicitly did not insist on saying, first you pay us solidarity, and if you pay us solidarity, then we will decarbonize. They said the most unfair scenario is the scenario where we are not effectively tackling climate change. The catastrophic impacts of climate change are going to be the most important injustice on climate. So we are not going in 2015 to first ask for money before we act. We are okay to accept the framework where everybody is going to act. China, India, Brazil, Russia, Europe, and the US are all needing to, uh, are all uh, expected to reduce their greenhouse gas emission. That is going to be much fairer than blocking action and first asking for money. Uh, and of course, that resonates probably quite a lot with the, uh, if, if, you, if you followed what happened in Sharm el-Sheikh, many of those countries who accepted that in 2015 are saying, I, I don't accept it anymore. You were supposed, we, I accept that I, I, I as Malawi or Bolivia have to reduce my greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Because, I, I, because that was a way also to push the biggest economies to do so uh, in order to protect our development from the catastrophic impacts of climate change. Now, six years or seven years after uh, the Paris Agreement, you have not acted, the big power, big economic powers have not acted sufficiently. And we are now experiences, experiencing this extremely unfair impacts of, uh, of climate change, catastrophic impacts of climate change. So the, the discussion needs to be reopened again. That is, that is what, what my colleague Sunita Narayan is writing in India. I'm writing from Paris that the Paris Agreement is still alive, but I'm seeing that it's really on the verge of being heavily contested because it's not, it's, it has not been able to deliver. Um, so, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you of that story between 2000 and uh, between Rio 92 and COP21. Um, and, and yes, I, I, was, I was writing here the end of history because at some point in 2015, we had the impression that we had set the most, the fairest and the most efficient. Ah, pardon, je, je bouge tellement par là que je suis plus sur la caméra. Chop. <laughs> we have, we have, uh, we had the impression to have participated in 2015 to setting the the, fa the the fairest multilateral framework and the most efficient multilateral framework possible. Not that it's perfect, but the one that was negotiable and putting us in the right direction. And everything seemed as if all countries were genuinely trying to do their best and to cooperate. And it sounded a little bit not. I, I put here the end of history, like Fukuyama after the the end of the of the uh, of the Cold War. But to some extent, we had the impression that cooperation was extremely important. But just the year after that, we had Trump. The year after that, we had Brexit, uh, and so cooperation was not really the 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 the. the so so, so the, 
the cooperative spirit that was very present in the year 2015, one year after that was completely absent. And, and I believe uh, that it was extremely interesting to see that despite uh, Trump's exiting the Paris Agreement and then getting back to it, uh, but when he exited the Paris Agreement, the, the bottom-up structure that I've just told you about where every country is accepting that they need to transform their, their economic system and then that we need to work together on making it, uh, on cooperating to make it, to make it, uh, to accelerate the transition. This was still very robust for a country like China, uh, that for a country like, for a region like Europe, for a country like Japan or, or South Korea. So this bottom-up approach is of course not delivering rapidly enough the results for protecting climate, but it's been robust to uh, one of the biggest powers in the world exiting the, uh, the, the agreement. Even if Trump was out, it made sense for China, for Japan, for South Korea, for Europe to say, my economy is going to be decarbonized. I will invest a lot of money in research and innovation to make a decarbonized, to make a, a decarbonized economy a reality. So you might question to what extent coal is back in China uh, and renewables are not uh, sufficiently funded. But uh, for the, uh, the, the, the Chinese colleagues with whom I've been discussing really are convinced, uh, and it's not because they, it's not propaganda from when they talk to me, that uh, the, the interest groups of the renewables are gaining power uh, over the, the interest groups of coal in China, and that this battle is never completely won, but that they gain more, always more power, and that what is the modernization of China will equal uh, decarbonization of the at, at least the energy system. I'm not talking about every other greenhouse gases. So that I'm actually already talking about my next slide. Uh, that was about uh, after 2015, uh, in a world where we need to be much more, not to be, uh, we, we need to get back to real politics and understand uh, what's actually happening in geopolitics. Um, and, and, and to me, the sign that is very important is 2019, the succession of declarations, as I've just told you, the Europe insisting on the Green Deal, putting the, uh, the, uh, the objective of minus 55% of greenhouse gases by 2030. Just after that, China issuing a five-year plan that was putting a lot of emphasis on decarbonization uh, and a goal of carbon neutrality by 20. 60, I believe, I'm not sure exactly about the date. And then uh, South Korea and Japan saying the same. So to some extent, the one, uh, uh, a series of the most innovative economies in the world were saying the future is getting out of fossil fuel or a decarbonized economy. Uh, and so that was very important because when they stated that, the US was still out and it was really that they were doing it for their own interest and not for the sake of protecting the planet. So that's something that I think was quite robust of the Paris Agreement to try and install a vision that the horizon, uh, the modernity is going to be decarbonized economy. When, that's a matter of discussion if we do it rapidly enough, but it's, it's, it's the future. Um, with the war in Ukraine, many economic players are not questioning that, but still for many of the governments that I've been naming now in Europe, in China, in Japan, in South Korea. This is the way for, in California also, it's the way forward. Uh, and interestingly, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to two reports that were issued. Uh, I can't remember exactly the date. This is 2021, and I think this is 2018. Um, you have an international organization that is called IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the International Agency for Renewables that has uh, uh, gathered a commission on the geopolitics of the world of renewables. And I think that's very interesting because, and that's also quite, um, you had also uh, uh, on, the, on the other side is a, is a policy brief by uh, Bruegel, a Brussels-based think tank um, on economic affairs in general, but they have, have published a paper on uh, if we are serious about the Green Deal, how is that going to change our relations to our neighbors? And in that paper, they were saying, um, if we're serious about the Green Deal, we are going to depend much less on fossil fuel imports from Algeria and Russia. 
And this is going to be problematic for those countries. So we need to care about security issues. So this was not prophetic saying that there was going to be a war in Ukraine, but it's just important to understand that, uh, as I was saying, there are other people like uh, Olivia Lazar from uh, Carnegie who are saying, she's saying that she saw uh, uh, a strategic study in Russian uh, of, uh, I don't know exactly which ministry in Russia, who was saying, um, we need to prepare for a very turbulent world and the, de the decarbonization of the economy is one of the key elements to which we need to prepare. Uh, and so this is also saying that it's, it's taken seriously even by the, uh, the fossil fuel producers. Um, and this report by IRENA, a new world, uh, uh, the geopolitics of the, uh, of the energy uh, transition, they are saying that we need to care for not only the fact that uh, for the whole of the 20th century, it's oil that has organized a lot of the wars and the geopolitics of the world around the Middle East, for instance. Uh, now, if we think of uh, a decarbonized economy, a lot of the critical materials like rare earth that are specifically in China or in African countries are going to be the new oil of this new century. So we need to understand how that reallocates power, resources, and potential zones of conflict. But that's not the only thing that they say. And I think that's important for me to, to also explain to you, to raise your attention to that uh, type of uh, report. They also say, a world where uh, we depend less on oil and much, and much more on, um, on uh, electricity will be a world of networks where uh, the security of networks will be extremely problematic. Of course, about data, but also even uh, physical networks. And so that changes quite a lot from because it's a very decentralized world where, you, where it's a world of renewables. Of course, you have the critical materials for batteries or for windmills. But you also have, in terms of the production, the, the resources is scattered everywhere. And so a lot, it's a, it's a world of interconnected, of, of an interconnection of, the, of electric, uh, of power networks. And in that case, it's the security of networks is not the same as the security of uh, very uh, concentrated resources. And I think that's really interesting to see how agencies that are dealing particularly with the environmental issues, they are actually also very importantly uh, now publishing reports on, on security, geopolitics, et cetera. Um, I know that I'm speaking quite a lot and that there is not much space for you to intervene. So one of you was uh, audacious enough to, to interrupt me. Please do it. I'm not, I'm not scared myself of being interrupted. So if you manage, just raise your hand and I'll slow down and, and give you the floor. Um, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to, to come back to is this, uh, uh, this idea of uh, where we are now um, with the idea that... Um, uh, there, there is so much uh, resonance or echo with 72 or 73, 74. Um, we have an, an energy crisis. Uh, we have now, we are back to a rivalry between uh, major political powers like Russia, China, and, and the Western world. Um, and you have these non aligned countries um, with the that resonates a lot with the non-aligned movement of, the, of that uh, area, of that era, or the new economic, uh, this, is, this is a stamp of 74 on the new uh, international economic order that was a project defended at the UN by the non-aligned movement. Um, my impression is that um, um, it's, we, with the war in Ukraine, um, security has become, oh yes, please. Just wait for the microphone. So just as you were saying about the non-aligned movement, and there was something that was boggling me uh, from the beginning of the presentation, because when you when you talked about India and uh, its claim on a more multipolar world and a structural change of global governance overall, I was wondering how different is that claim from China's claim? Like China claims for a basket of currency, for example, for the IMF, it doesn't claim to overcome the dollar. So in which way is this really like polarized like in the 70s where you were two worlds in different systems and in which way it's actually challenges to one unilateral system controlled by the US? Um, thanks for the question. I, I would say, 
I mean, th this is a, I'm not exactly on my expert field and it's good that you question me on that. Um, I'm using the idea of non-aligned uh, in a way that I see a lot of symmetry between. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, the, the West and the East and in between those non-aligned with uh, Indonesia, Yugoslavia, Algeria, uh, and India at that time who were saying, I don't want to be aligned with either the, the USSR or the US, and I want to, to have my own, my own plane. Today, I see uh, the reason why I'm saying non-aligned is also to say that um, African colleagues are telling us, don't ask our government to choose between China and the West. So it's not exactly the same, but it's China versus the West, Russia being not so clear somewhere, uh, and some countries in the, in the South saying, we have not done our development. We're still in the process of development. China is much more advanced uh, and they have another model. They want to claim other institutions. We want to be able to, uh, uh, to uh, we want to claim our autonomy in defining our development pathway and not be uh, obliged to choose between the two, uh, the two uh, major economic powers. Um, and, uh, we, for the moment, globalization as it is, has not served our, our development. The, the globalization of the 90s and the years 2000 has basically served China, uh, not uh, African countries, for instance. I've, I've never heard them claim that as explicitly, but that's, that's something that I think is also behind a lot of the claims by, by sovereign countries, that for the moment, the globalization as it is, the international economic order that has benefited China is still very unfair for them. Uh, and so no, in, you, you saw that in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, that Timmermans, the uh, European vice president, was trying to divide the G77 plus China. The, 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 the group is called G77 plus China. Uh, it's the group of poor countries that are much more than 77 plus China. And it's called like that. And for more than a decade, Europe is trying to divide uh, that group to have more power over, over the group and, and trying to separate China from the, from the others. Uh, and that is very, a very dangerous game to play because whenever Europe tries to do that, that sticks the group <laughs> together. And a lot of the Southern countries, African countries were saying about the, the, the discussion on the loss and damage. Uh, I, I can explain what this, this discussion was, but if you, if you accept, I've just designated like that. The discussion on loss and damage, Tim Amont said, okay, we have a dedicated fund for loss and damage, but China needs to contribute. And then the Southern countries were saying, no, 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 don't mix up. You have a first responsibility as uh, the ones who de industrialized first. Let us stick together. You want to divide us to gain, again, power over us. So they stick together. I'm, I'm not sure I really correctly <laughs> answer your question. This is just to say how I, I see similarities, but also differences with, the, with that moment. Um, and what I saw very explicitly is not the Indian government, but Indian experts uh, repeatedly telling Chinese experts uh, that we would have a much clearer conversation if we accept that you are not a developing country anymore. Uh, that was also a way to say, let's look at those, the, 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 or I could also refer to a very important report that I advise you to have a look at, the report by Nick Stern, Vera Songwe, and Amar Bhattacharya. Uh, so Nick Stern, you know, is the one, who, the, the British economist who did the, the Stern review in 2005 about the cost of inaction on climate change. And he has worked last year with uh, Amar Bhattacharya, who's uh, at Brookings in Washington, but who's an, an Indian economist, and Vera Songwe, who's an, uh, an, an, uh, she was the head of the uh, UN Economic Commission for Africa. And they published a, a paper where they said, if we don't look at China, but at the rest of the global south, we have an enormous problem that is that these countries uh, have uh, particularly suffered from the sequence of crisis, uh, COVID, war in Ukraine, uh, increase in energy and food prices. And they are particularly submitted to uh, the impacts of uh, catastrophic climate change. And at the same time, they don't have the fiscal space to uh, fund their own recovery plans. And on top of that, there is a risk that all the regulation that we have on the greening for the financial system will divert even more investments from those countries. And so their report is saying, 
If we compute the yearly need for investment in those countries, southern countries except China, it's two trillion dollars a year. Because in these, within these countries, you have uh, important economies like India, maybe half of these two trillions, one of these, of these two trillions could be funded domestically, but there is all, at least one trillion dollars per year that needs to come from northern countries to fund investments for sustainable development in those southern countries, and particularly investments for climate adaptation to protect ca natural capital and to prevent or to deal with losses and loss and damage. Uh, that figure to me is extremely important because that really designates that part of the global south who is currently, uh, who was emerging economically and is now not, uh, is, has been stopped by the series of crises. Uh, and that's what I'm meaning here is that these countries are the, non, the new non-aligned. Uh, they are not organized as a movement now as, as they were in the 70s. But I think that these are the countries that we particularly need to have a look at because they uh, are the ones that are, uh, I mean, if we don't solve the problem of their access to investment this year, this is going to be the end of cooperation on climate, but more generally. Uh, and this is why you have so much emphasis by uh, uh, Janet Yellen at the US Treasury. She uh, expressed very explicitly in October at the annual assemblies of IMF and uh, the World Bank that the US government wanted a reform of the international financial system to make it more able to, to, to uh, attract public and private finance in those countries in need. You had uh, Mia Motley, the prime minister of Barbados, who developed her Bridgetown agenda. Uh, have a look at that. I mean, Mia Motley, I'm a fan of this politician because she's extremely uh, uh, eloquent and, and, and what she claims for Barbados and for Southern countries is extremely moving and at the same time, very uh, powerful politically. And Mia Motley has uh, developed a Bridgetown agenda when she, where she also develops a whole story about debt, IMF reform, World Bank reform to be able to ensure that those countries that are most vulnerable, very indebted, very poor, have access to the investment they need to get out of the crisis. That was so Janet Yellen in the US, Mia Motley on our Bridgetown agenda, and Macron joined Mia Motley and said, I want to build a summit on a new deal for a new financial deal for southern countries in, in June in, in Paris, where we would make a uh, a moment where we discuss how far we are able to, what new elements we have to, to solve the problem. And so the, between uh, fall 2022 and uh, fall 2023, we have a series of very important moments to try and find a solution to this financial problem that is also critical for environmental action. If we don't solve that, we will not, not have uh, the level of environmental ambition that is needed in India, in Brazil, in South Africa. And so this is a, a very important moment, both for justice and development in those countries, but also for, for the environment. So that's basically, I'm, I'm not sure, I've, I've talked a lot for a very, as you said, short question, but that's my answer to your, to your question. Um, one last thing that I wanted to, to say is um, security is everywhere in our conversations, particularly, I was, I was, already saying that last year in this very conference, but particularly with the war in Ukraine, a lot of the economic players, a lot of the, uh, uh, of the governments are looking at every issue with the security lens. And for Europe, for instance, it's been compatible with the environmental ambition in terms of uh, greenhouse gases, relatively compatible at least, because for European governments, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is quite compatible with reducing our energy consumption in terms of su sufficiency or sobriety in energy consumption is very, has gained political traction because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and so that's, I think, something where the security lens is not completely negative for what we, uh, for what we have on, 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 the, uh, on the environmental objectives. Uh, but I, I believe one thing that would be extremely important is to be able to enlarge the notion of security that is about security of energy supply to something that would encompass also ecological security. You have that concept again by, by Bertrand Badi. I mentioned that uh, eminent professor of Sciences Po in international relations, where he's advocating a lot for an extended notion of uh, 
security that would be human security, encompassing ecological security uh, and the other notions of security. It seems a little bit utopian, but I believe uh, it makes sense because of what people see now of the catastrophic impact of climate degradation or the impacts of uh, biodiversity degradation. So there might be something quite interesting around that. Um, and so my last point, two last points on uh, something that's, uh, when I talk to uh, think tanks in international relations, they always think that I'm a utopian leftist. Uh, so claiming that solidarity is better than no solidarity, that justice matters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, in general, they disregarded those specialized on the environment until very recently as something very anecdotal that has no, no, power, no, no meaning, uh, no significance in terms of uh, power relations. So these think tanks are now considering that the environment is actually also center stage on, on what defines power uh, and all power relations. But they still believe that I'm that I'm a utopian, uh, as we say in French, uh, that I'm a bisounours. I don't know for that. It is, is impossible to translate. Uh, but it's like a, when you are too naive and think that uh, the rosy things are going to happen because they are they seem better. And so um, they, I have now this particular discussion about the fact that I'm claiming that if we don't solve the economic and financial problem of those countries that are needing this trillion dollars per year, uh, this is going to be a problem also for the US, for Europe, and for China. Um, and this is something that is, uh, as I said in the beginning, quite different from the 70s. In the 70s, the new, the, these same countries have asked for a new economic, international economic order, and the world functioned for uh, five more decades without uh, changing the structure of the world that is that was still extremely unfair uh, and that has not changed. Why would the major economic powers care more for these uh, for these claims of justice and solidarity? As I was telling you, I believe the countries that are uh, these global South countries, they can negotiate because they are future markets and because their vote at the UN is considered very important, at least for Europe, and I believe also for others like China and even maybe the US. And so I'm sorry to be, I'm, I'm trying to use uh, very instrumental or cynical arguments, but I believe these ones are functioning, at least in the European context. I'm sure that Europe is desperate for finding more uh, allies in the voting system at, at the UN, or at least to preserve the UN system rather than having it uh, completely deconstruct. And so they are really going to try and solve the problem of these countries, not just because it's a moral argument or a moral imperative, but because it's also serving the interests of the European Union. Um, and, and on top of that, Europe is also a very resource scarce continent. And so Europe is also looking at the resources in Africa uh, to ensure that we have the critical material that we need. Germany is looking, I'm, I'm, I'm saying Germany because of, often I'm criticizing France and France is, should be criticized on what they do in Africa. But Germany is thinking that they will import a lot of green hydrogen from Africa. Green hydrogen meaning you produce electricity with photovoltaics or windmills and then you uh, transform it into green hydrogen and you can transport it to Europe because transporting electricity and you can't store electricity and transporting it on long distances is not possible because you would you, you have too many losses uh, and that would not be possible. And this for many of our African colleagues seems again as Europe is going to put Africa back as a provider of raw materials, like a real post-colonial uh, framing of the relation between Africa and Europe. Namibia is a country where they, the president is insisting that the future of Namibia is about exporting hydrogen to Europe. Uh, and he has refined his narrative a lot, saying we need first the electricity that we have before exporting it to Europe. We need to ensure that all Namibians have access to electricity. And for the moment, it's not the case. And on top of that, we need to ensure that we have electricity, not just for households, but also for the industrialization of Namibia in order to have industrial jobs for a growing population. And so he, he's refining the story about this global value chain 
of green hydrogen. You know, uh, the geopolitics of uh, renewables is also about that. We are building up new supply chains at global scale that would be the export of green hydrogen from Africa to Europe. And the story that the Namibian president is developing is a story where uh, it would not be just the export of raw material, but there would be first uh, jobs, industrial jobs, added value captured in Namibia, and not just, uh, you know, the story of raw material export uh, in a colonial model is that there is no added value in the country, and it's not enabling any development in the country, it's just export. So they are trying to build a new uh, model. Um, I'm not completely convinced by the, uh, the new narrative of the Namibian government because it seems technically extremely complicated. The production of electricity is in the north, the population for industrial jobs is in the south. So I don't know exactly how they're going to do that really uh, actively. But there is a lot of emphasis now on trying to see how we can ensure that this new world of a decarbonized economy that we are building is really going to help development in southern countries rather than putting back those countries into the state of a, a raw materials provider for the, the big powers of the world. And this is really very, there is a very thin line on that. And I'm not sure that this is a matter of WTO regulation. It's a lot about how an economic player from Europe in investing in, or a Chinese investor is investing in Namibia and how it's, uh, the, that operator is accepting to ensure that there is industrial development in the country or not. It might be a lot on the regulation for foreign di direct investment in those countries, but it's not an international diplomacy issue. It's really about how you have a discipline of economic players in the countries. And this puts a lot of uh, emphasis on how European economic players are going to behave in their relation with African countries. And I'm trying to raise the attention of the French government and, and the other governments in Europe, that they would need to ensure that they can control or compel these uh, economic operators that the way they invest in African countries is building innovation capacity, jobs, and, add, and added value capture in those countries and not capturing everything here. And you know probably that in France, the whole notion is that we want to relocalize, to reshore, to have again our industrial jobs in France. So domestically, Macron might be saying, I want industrial jobs in France. When he talks to uh, Namibia or to uh, Niger or to Benin, he says, I want the industrial jobs to be also on your side. And I think my job is to ensure that this is not a zero sum game where the industrial jobs are either in Namibia or in Germany, but that, they can, that we can build global supply chains where the industrial jobs would be more in, on both sides because else I don't see how we could build those structural alliances that I was trying to, to talk about at the beginning. You had a question, you need to wait for the microphone. Uh, I just wanted to know what the source of power in geopolitics is for a country. Like, uh, like, what is the source of legitimacy for France to be for France to have more power than Namibia or India? Uh, yeah. Um, I believe that I'm uh, again. I'm I'm not a very good political scientist because I'm, I'm coming to actually more from the poly, public policy analysis than really uh, studying what power means. What I See in your question is two different things at least, and maybe you need to reformulate your, you need to react to my answer. You were discussing what are the sources of power and you were discussing what are the source of legitimacy. And to me, they, they are not necessarily overlapping. You might have power without being legitimate. Huh? Uh, that's, that's something that I, I mean, what I, when I'm looking at power relations globally, uh, the power is the source of power to me is your economic power uh, and, and, and often that explains also your military power, for instance. And that's in the geopolitics between, go between national governments. Huh? I'm, not, I'm aware that uh, transnational companies have other sources of power because they, they can decide on many things that are not regulated by governments. But so the source of power to me is a lot about the, 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 the size of your economy and the size of your, of your army. Uh, that would be my right. assessment, very rough, but nevertheless quite robust, of who has the power. And that's why I'm saying China is a big power, India is a big power, uh, the US is a big power, but there is, no, there, is, there is no such a thing as a big power in Africa for the moment, for instance. Uh, then the legitimacy is different. The legitimacy to exert power uh, in international relations, you don't have that. 
I would say, I would contend that the UN is the most legitimate thing that, you, that we have, but the UN governance is extremely unfair uh, because it dates back to 45 when a lot of the countries were still under colonial domination. So uh, I prefer to play on the legitimacy of the UN as it is because I prefer that we keep the institutions at least and that we try to reform them. So I find the UN legitimate, but it's, not, it's still very unfair. So I, I, we might continue that conversation, but I, I hope that at least you, you see how I talked about power in, uh, in my former um, talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the element with, uh, which has brought us to the climate issues and all the society we, we are facing now are also ideological and connected first from capitalism and then the different phase of capitalism and especially now the neoliberalism. And but when you talked about the different model used by governments and also uh, environmental uh, uh, economists and whatsoever, they always use, like for instance, Globium is the model of uh, Yaza. The, the economic module is a um, general equilibrium model. And there's, uh, most of the, this, this model are using uh, ground, economic ground, which is wrong, like, or, or at least, which is at the roots of the, the, the issue we are facing now. So, so uh, what's your, your point of view of that? Um, it's, it's, I think you're, you're pointing at a very crucial issue here. Um, I see at least two, two parts of, the, of your question. One is about how we represent the world uh, with a model like uh, Globium uh, from IASA, who represents global commodity markets on agriculture, for instance, uh, and very often, even in, in the current capitalistic system that we have, the representation is, is insufficient or is invisibilizing important issues. For instance, they talk about uh, land use change, but there is nothing about land tenure governance. And land tenure governance is never, is never should not be reduced to a pure market. It exists in some countries. If it's just a market on land, it can be uh, really the worst thing you do to, uh, to smallholder farmers. So yes, the representation, the analytical representation of the world in economics is often invisibilizing very important things. And that's already a problem just to uh, understand what's happening on the, on, on the ground. Then on, uh, if we want to solve the problem, we might need to explore solutions that are not so much market driven. Uh, this is, I think, something that is extremely uh, uh, important. And the, the, I know that I need to finish in a few minutes, but I still want to uh, open, not a parenthesis, but a way to answer, to, to answer you is, uh, at IDRI, for the moment, we are never beginning one of our recommendations or, or statements by saying uh, capitalism is the problem. Uh, that does not mean that our colleagues or myself are not agreeing with you on that. Um, I, I, I don't ask people coming to Idri if they can subscribe to, uh, can we go, can we solve the, the environmental problem by staying in the same capitalistic system or do we need to change? That's not, I don't, I, I'm happy that there is a diversity of, of judgments about that. But I, we, a lot of us are seeing that this is a key question that we, that we need to address. What we believe for the moment is that it's important in society that there are uh, scholars in university NGOs, civil society, and political movements that are claiming that we need to change the capitalistic system. Our position in the ecosystem, as I told you, we want to have that dialogue with the French transnational companies, for instance. I believe still, I still believe, but that might change in the years to come, that there is a usefulness as, as a complement to those who are claiming that we need to change capitalism for us, to not say that as a premise, to continue the conversation with the capitalistic organizations that are currently dominating and explain to them step by step that if they are serious about science, they also need to change the, uh, the capitalistic system. But not putting that as the entry point, but trying to get there as a conclusion. Uh, for instance, we work on the agroecological transition in Europe. Uh, and for the moment, we, just, we are just exploring how are we going to make the agroecological transition in Europe if we stay in the current structure of the, uh, of the agricultural policy. 
the agricultural policy in Europe is not market driven. There is so much public money that it's extremely, uh, it's, it's capitalistic, but it's very, lots of, of state intervention in that, in that policy. Um, and uh, we are exploring that and step by step with the uh, cooperatives, with the uh, multinationals like Danone, we are coming to the point that if they are serious, there, the strategy to make an agroecological transition in Europe that could be a good, good solution for climate and biodiversity is not going to be compatible with shareholder capitalism in cooperatives, because cooperatives are initially cooperatives, but they are not multinationals like Limagra. It's incompatible. And so they need, we need to change the statute of companies. But we are not addressing the capitalist system as a whole, but trying to get to some of its key features and criticize them with the players that are dominating. So in terms of political strategy, I'm feeling that IDRI for the moment is still useful in trying to having a close dialogue with the dominant powers who are completely embedded in the capitalist system for the moment. If I would say we need to change the capitalist system, they would not talk to me anymore. It's important that others are saying that because I believe that we need to question that as you did. But there is a usefulness still for people who are trying to have a more uh, close dialogue with those uh, players that are uh, in the dominant ideology and trying to push the boundaries of that ideology. I'm reflecting now, I've, I've, I've been discussing that, uh, I don't know, we had a kind of a seminar to just begin the year after COP27 and COP15. And I was discussing with my colleagues, how, how long are we, is our position going to be still relevant? Uh, and we could at some point use our legitimacy to be known as reformists rather than revolutionaries to tell them it's, it's finished. We don't believe anymore that we can play in the same rules of the capitalistic system. And it's actually the system that we need to change. So that, that I'm, but for the moment, I see our usefulness more on the reformist side than on the revolutionary side. Not saying that I, I fight with the revolutionaries. I, we coordinate so that we have joint action to try and change the system. Uh, I have a reaction to uh, to the question I asked before, um, which is essentially, is there an acknowledgement that the future source of power will come from a healthy ecology, like uh, countries that have access to um, reasonable environmental resources will be countries that in, in the future will be geopolitically powerful? Or yeah. is there no acknowledgement of that? I mean, in the academic field, this is a very important discussion that you are asking. Let me, let me be sure, uh, ensure that I've understood. You were saying those countries who would have a good management of their resources, would that be a source of uh, legitimate power? Um, that's my hope. To some extent, again, I'm, I'm uh, in the academic field, there is the whole notion of trying to rebalance the sources of power. But uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, we have no government of the world. So there is no uh, overarching principle that would enable to uh, say wh who legitimately has the power. The power in the world, in international relations, will be claimed on the basis of things that are more on the reality of power than on the legitimacy of power. Nevertheless, it's important that in the institutions that do exist, like the UN Security Council, uh, the new institutions that the China is trying to install with its Belt and Road Initiative, for instance, that we try to make power more legitimate or the, the capacity to participate to governance, give more space to those countries who would have legitimacy to power because they, 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 play, they, they, they have a good management of their resources. What I, what I believe is going to be the, the, the image to me that comes to me when I listen to you is that in 73, rather than having a new economic order, we have OPEC, meaning those countries who had the economic power of having oil were the ones who were able to, uh, to take the power economically and politically. I mean, politically to some extent, I'm not saying that Saudi Arabia is uh, very sovereign because it's very aligned with the US. But to some extent, you see, the real politic is often hard after these claims by the, the non-aligned, actually those who earned power who exerted power was just those who had the resources, um, but they were they were they played it uh, with some wisdom 
I'm sorry, I'm not really a fan of Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates as such, but they played it with wisdom to ensure their power. DRC has a lot of critical minerals. DRC could be claiming that they will have power because they have the sources of energy uh, for the rest of the world. But DRC is a very weak country and it might be on the completely contrary to uh, Saudi Arabia becoming uh, the country that is going to be completely, uh, how do you say that, uh, uh, exploited by others. So it's not sure that it's because you have the resources that you have the power. But the example of 50 years ago is that uh, rather than giving legitimate power to those who are the good ones, you give it to those who have the resources um, and, and a kind of a cartel of resources. Another, I, I know that I need to finish and I'm sorry because everybody needs to leave. Uh, there was this claim by uh, Lula, uh, no, sorry, it was still not Lula, Brazil, DRC and Indonesia, that they wanted to establish an OPEC of forests. Symbolically, it's interesting because that means that they want to exhort a power on the fact that the forest that they have is not exactly a resource, but it's a common, it's a common good. And so they want to get, get money out of that. But actually, it's, forests are not a resources. And for the moment, nobody is believing that they will have any power. When, in, when the OPEC in 73 just said, we are going to produce less oil, prices went up and they had material power. Uh, Brazil, DRC, and Indonesia might say, we have the forests. So what? Uh, they have no power to be exerted on, on Europe. So, I mean, I'm, I think I need to stop here. But what you are, if you are really interested in those notions, I don't know if you are a political scientist, but power is a, is a very el elusive uh, notion. Power is the capacity to have someone else do something you want him to do or her to do. And that's the basic definition. Uh, the rest is very elusive, and that's why legitimacy is important, but also the reality of how you can exert that power over someone else is very important. And so you can claim that you have the power because you are morally doing the right thing, but that doesn't, in, in a world where you have no overall constitution or overall government, uh, it's how you can exert power on the other that is going to matter. Thanks for your attention. I've been talking probably too much, but I think I haven't lost most of you. I'm, I'm very proud of you because it's uh, very late in the week. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me. I, I will send a PowerPoint. You have my email at the end. And if you're interested in IDRI, we have uh, internships. Uh, look at our web website. We have internships or also other positions that are that are open to quite, uh, quite often. And we are very eager to have a diversity of students like you are tonight in the, in the